everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our mental health forum. Um, today we have um, Dr. Cindy Liu and Dr. Maggie Alegria and um, moderated by Dr. Bizu Galaye on uh, mental health disparities. Just a few opening remarks before I introduce them. Um, this, this forum will be a uh, panel, so there'll be um, some questions that we have that Bizu has for our speakers, and then um, there'll be some presentation um, from Dr. Liu, and then we will have, we'll take your questions. You can, um, hopefully everyone knows how to use Zoom now, but you can, use um, the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen for posting questions. That is the best way to post questions because that will be, um, that then they will, Beezy will see them and then he can post, uh, post them to their panelists. And if there are some specific things that I can easily answer, I can also answer as we go along. Um, in terms of the chat feature, um, Shaylee will be putting at the end of the of the session, she'll be putting resources in the chat uh, the chat feature and um, answer other questions about that. Um, and I think that is it for now. I'm just seeing if she has something. Um, yes, and the and this is being recorded. There was an announcement at the beginning. So um, just in terms of introducing our speakers, we are really lucky today to have um, Dr. Bizu Galaye, who's an assistant professor in epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, he's my colleague and he's gonna be moderating the session. Um, we were really lucky to have Dr. Maggie Alegria, who's professor in the Department of Medicine and Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And she's the chief in disparities reach of the disparities research unit at the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. And we also have Dr. Cindy Liu, who's director of the Developmental Risk and Cultural Disparities Program, uh, an assistant professor in the Departments of Pediatric, Newborn Medicine, and Psychiatry in Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. And I really appreciate them taking their time here today to talk to us about mental health and disparities. Um, so Bizu, take it away. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, you know, for many of us in public health, it's no surprise that a crisis like this pandemic oftentimes amplifies what we already know about existing disparities, be it in physical health or mental health. Um, we know that health outcomes and risk factors are not equally distributed in our society. Um, members of racial ethnic minority groups and those with low SES are disproportionately affected and exposed to health outcomes as well as to the risk factors across the life course. And based on data that is coming out from many states, including Massachusetts, which by the way is inadequate data that we are already seeing disparities on who gets infected, who gets tested, and who dies from COVID-19. This morning, I looked at the uh, Boston Health Department to see uh, the distribution, which by the way has substantial missing data, almost on one third of the population, and based on just quick look at the data, black residents make up about 41% of positive cases reported, despite making up 25% of the population. So there are some discussions, um, people trying to explain why this might be the case, but oftentimes in those discussions, the missing element is what are the mental health outcomes, are the disparities in mental health outcomes. So I'm really excited to speak with uh, both of you, Cindy and Maggie, um, your work is focused on mental health outcomes. I know that we have uh, a, a wide range of audience um, to just help us kickstart. Why don't I start with your own work and help us understand in general, prior to COVID-19, what are some of the disparities in mental health outcomes and risk factors and treatment gaps in the US? Maybe I could start with you, Maggie. Say that, uh Thank you so much for inviting me. I, uh, I've been studying this area for a long, long time, Bisu, and as you have said, the, the actual uh, data in terms of when you look at epidemiologic data, we found that actually the mental health of uh, ethnic racial minorities tends to be pretty much better uh, overall at the national level. It's really the consequences of mental health that really have a tremendous impact uh, because the consequences tend to be worse for ethnic racial minorities. Um, 
the, it's not surprising that we're seeing this uh, epidemic have a terrible impact on communities of color. We've seen this way before since, you know, there's been several studies from before this epidemic saying that when you link poverty, social determinants of health, inequality, they're the same uh, problems that uh, foster unequal morbidity and mortality. So it's not very surprising. I think for mental health, COVID has been the canary in the mine. It is really something that we have to deal now in terms of disparities, because like the Commonwealth uh, Fund just published how you know death is higher in communities, uh, black communities. We're also seeing some a very important data that the Guardian published on how the deaths are also higher in Latino communities. But I don't think we're prepared for uh, the pandemic in terms of the after effects. Uh, of COVID in terms of mental health. And I'm particularly worried about the consequence in terms of interpersonal violence. I'm worried in terms of mental health, but also disability, given the impact of the recession and also the isolation, and uh, especially isolation in the absence of social support. For example, in MGH, in the hotline for reporting of uh, problems of inter intimate partner violence, there has been almost a duplication of calls for uh, this problem. And we're also seeing uh, that families that are frail economically are also under considerable stress, you know. So I think the fear, uncertainty, economic losses, will really trigger uh, inequities in similar ways of past recessions. And there has been excellent data on this area. Uh, systematic reviews have shown that the people that get uh, more hit are the people that have, you know, frail, that are losing their jobs. And as we know, the people that are losing their jobs are people in the uh, hospitality uh, and um, industry, people that are losing their jobs in restaurants, low-wage uh, workers that overrepresented by ethnic racial minorities. So I think that both Blacks and Hispanics will experience incredible stress. And I'm just hoping that uh, we don't, that we really help this populations early on in terms of mental health so that we don't end up like uh, what we're seeing in our studies is that people are really asking for help early on. So we should be very receptive and make sure that the structural barriers to get help have been open and that we disseminate enough information of not, how, not only how to get mental health and substance abuse care, but also get the determ social determinants of health that are so interwoven with uh, mental health and substance abuse. I'm gonna leave it there and then we can come back. Thank you, thank, thank you, my guest. Especially, I think, you know, what can we do now is something that I want us to um, continue to discuss, but um, Cindy? Yeah, no, um, thank you for um, having me join on this panel. And um, my work has focused on psychosocial stress over the course of development. And um, I would have to say um, that my work, you know, and, and what we found reinforces what Dr. Alegria had mentioned, that it's really not so much rates of mental health, it's more about the consequences of the stressors that um, many um, vulnerable populations are confronted with. And so um, it's not just, you know, looking at race and ethnicity, there's also subgroup differences as well. And when you start to um, peel back these different groups, you start to recognize that um, each, each group has their own unique types of um, stressors and vulnerabilities, um, not to mention uh, challenges with access, as well as stigma in accessing um, mental health uh, supports. So those are all just uh, you know, some of the, the um, factors that I look at in my research. Um, but when it comes to um, COVID-19, it's this sort of perfect storm of events that really leads to um, 
these, what I would say very expected disparities that we're seeing. And um, it's also sort of uniquely tied to mental health as well, because everybody can recognize that this is taking a toll on mental health. So that's no surprise. And in some ways, um, the fact that everybody can feel it and, and, and can sort of recognize what it feels like to be depressed or anxious, in some ways that takes away from the stigma of what a lot of people may have already been experiencing. Um, but because that is happening to everybody, um, um, what has happened is that um, um, people are starting to try to figure out why. And what, what we're seeing is also these sort of, um, not just um, these narratives, I would say, coming out about different cultural groups and the origin of the virus um, and who's, you know, who's spreading the contagion. So we're seeing some of these narratives um, take place out in the open um, as people are naturally trying to figure out where this comes from. And so that sort of, um, I would say, um, not just challenges um, groups um, in regards to, you know, the mental health impacts of the, the direct mental health impacts, but also these secondary effects that are coming out in rhetoric. Um, the public health response to viral transmission itself, the fact that we're socially isolated, um, that in turn may disproportionately affect a lot of um, already vulnerable populations. Um, and so this is all on top of the existing vulnerabilities um, that we're seeing um, you know, that we've already seen. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I can go into more of that, but that's just um, sort of what I've been um, observing so far. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks, Cindy and, and Maggie. I think, you know, in many ways, both of you have anticipated what, you know, my next question is how, um, you know, how is institutional and structural racism particularly playing out in COVID-19 and how might be how are they contributing to existing disparities? You uh, mentioned a lot of this already, Maggie, in, in your um, introduction, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how this is playing out in the current pandemic. Yeah, I think you, you started with one that to me is very important, which is uh, the issue of uh, not making these populations invisible. And part of the problem of uh, collecting data, good data, and I, and I completely agree with Cindy, good data in terms not only of uh, race, ethnicity, but language. And actually, you know, these groups are different. So we need to respond to their unique needs in, in very different ways. So that's one big problem. I think a second big problem in, in terms of institutional racism, I would, I would say about the money. Who's getting the money? Uh, for this uh, small businesses. We should be giving the money to communities that are hard hit by COVID and communities that are hard hit by losing employment. And so the money is not necessarily going to those communities. And I'm not sure they're gonna be able to access some of that. I think the third area is the, the policies with regards to job security. Uh, and job benefits that we should definitely look at. The people that are, have, that are not able to telework, the people that are not able to miss their jobs because they're gonna be thrown out, even if they're feeling symptoms, are the people that we want to make sure that we maintain uh, safe and that we give them enough resources so that they can stay home. And I think the policies related to jobs um, are, are critical. Uh, we saw this, for example, in the um, uh, food you know, production where people are having to go to work even though they're gonna be in crowded spaces with a lot of other people with themselves. And we are seeing that in families that you know, one of the uh, people in the family is supporting everyone in the family and they just don't, even though some of the people in their family have symptoms, they can't risk losing their job. So I think those are a few of the ones that I think are central. No, absolutely. Um, I, I agree, uh, Maggie. I think, you know, um, I remember when Boston Public Schools decided to uh, close they had to ensure that they provide uh, free meals to the students because the school is the only place where uh, many of the students 
could um, get their daily meal. So in many ways, I think, you know, all the existing insecurities, be it job security, food insecurity, and resources are uh, critical and particularly being played out in, in the current pandemic. Cindy, I wonder if you have any other Yeah, other. well, you know, I think that people's identities are completely highlighted here. I think people are starting to recognize, hey, I'm part of that community that is experiencing these um, enormous stressors or this, these unique challenges. Um, you know, my group is being called out for being the one that's spreading the disease. And so I think there's also this awareness as people are trying to figure out how to um, how to, you know, pay their bills, um, how to not contract the virus. I think that these um, identities are just so salient at this point. And then because of that, it, it sort of reinforces being different. And so when we think about um, mental health, um, you know, it, it is these consequences um, and these day-to-day -day challenges, but it's also now, I would say, with this pandemic, um, who you are kind of matters. Um, and that I think will really exacerbate um, the, the discrimination effects on mental health itself. So just being identified as different. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, this is a, a nice segue to uh, my next question uh, to you, Cindy, which is I know some people have called the pandemic the great equalizer at the beginning. Mm. You know that the virus itself doesn't discriminate based on personal attributes or um, group identities based on race, SES, but we've seen some of its disproportionate impact on those who are least likely to have the resources to fight, as I mentioned earlier. But also certain groups have been, um, you know, called out and discriminated. And I know, Cindy, you, are, you have an ongoing study and uh, some preliminary result that um, you would like to share. And I wonder if I could ask you to share maybe, uh, what are you finding in your study what are you uh, trying to, to highlight in this case? Are there some data that show certain subgroups are affected based on your preliminary analysis? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to share that. I'll just pull up my screen here. Um, well, first off, let me um, jump back to something that Dr. Alegria had said early on, which is differences by, um, by different groups and what we, you know, um, disparities that we do or do not see. So. Um, what I have here is data from the CARE study. We launched this on April 13th, and this is data from um, a, almost a thousand uh, respondents. Um, here I'm reporting on subgroups that have more than a hundred um, uh, respondents. And I have been assessing a, a number of different um, mental health measures. Um, here I present um, information on clin clinical levels of depression and anxiety. You'll see on the left, um, women uh, have uh, show that um, more women than men have been reporting um, um, elevated levels of depression and anxiety, which is actually consistent with the literature. We do see in general that women report more depression and anxiety, but you'll see these absolute values being quite high. Um, these are, um, uh, our, our study participants are between the ages of 18 to 30, but here we're seeing at least a third of um, women and um, about four out of 10 women in our sample reporting really, really high rates um, of depression and anxiety. If you look in the middle, you'll see that um, I looked at uh, racial and ethnic differences. Again, here, these are the individ uh, groups that have more than 100 um, participants um, overall. And we see here that actually whites, um, white Americans um, report um, more depression and anxiety compared to um, Asian American and um, African Americans. So, um, so in terms of just symptoms, we're not seeing um, necessarily elevated rates among minorities here. Um, and it's the same as well if you stratify by whether or not they are come from an immigrant family. So the question was, are you from a first or second generation family? Um, again, you don't really see um, these elevated rates. Um, but I'll go to the next slide, and what I'll, you'll, you'll see here is that we've also asked questions about these experiences specific to, um, to um, COVID, and 
um, disc so discrimination specific to COVID. And we've been hearing in the news um, quite a bit about um, racial discrimination against um, a number of groups. Um, and I've been interested in Asian Americans in particular. Um, we asked questions about whether um, our, our, respond, our participants had ever experienced discrimination that was specifically directed to them or to their family because of COVID. Um, and there were pretty elevated reports here about one out of one, um, a third of our participants indicated that they were a, fa they were a family member um, um, experienced um, others avoiding physical contact with them or remarks about Chinese or Asian people being dirty um, or remarks about um, needing to avoid Chinese or Asian food because of um, potential um, uh, contagion. So that's microaggression, but I think what was startling in our data um, was that um, when asked about um, assaults, verbal assaults and physical assaults, they were quite high as well. Um, about one out of five um, participants in our study so far have reported, um, at least among Asians, have reported um, verbal assaults and 17% um, of our respondents reported knowing that, uh, reporting that they or a family member have been physically assaulted. And these numbers are actually consistent with some other data coming out um, related to Asian Americans. Um, so, you know, what, what we had said earlier about mental health concerns, so far we haven't seen the elevated symptoms among minority groups, but we are seeing these challenges. Um, um, I would, you know, that challenges is, is probably not strong of a word, enough of a word, but actually um, racial incidences against Asians. Um, you know, you might be wondering, what is it that people are, are experiencing? Like, what, it, what are the, the, the specific experiences? And um, some, some people have shared with us quite openly, and I've really appreciated hearing sort of um, more in depth about what has happened. And these are just some examples to highlight a couple um, one, one person was in China during mid-January and when they came back to the U.S. after being quarantined in China, they felt really sad, but uh, they, they mentioned that um, Americans didn't really know why they felt sad um, because they thought it was the flu. Um, and they also didn't, they thought that they were, um, they didn't understand why they were um, reacting that way. Um, and then they also had to explain why people were wearing, Chinese people were wearing masks, but then um, when, they got, when Italy got hit really hard by COVID, um, the, this person's American friend started to pay attention. And so they felt like there was a double standard that they were misunderstood um, over, over um, um, the COVID. Um, um, and then there's just multiple um, other examples of um, Asians experiencing higher levels of anxiety about um, being Asian. Um, and then we also have at the very top of, um, a quote um, from it, um, a respondent who said that they lost multiple members of the virus. Um, they specifically called out the healthcare disparities faced by African Americans. And, um, you know, these, these stories are really sad. Um, I look at numbers, but I also look at these stories too, and it really definitely sheds light on the complex um, experiences that people are having. So I'll, I'll end that there. Um, Thank you. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, uh, Cindy. I think um, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a complex story. It's, um, um, but woven, what we see is the effects of discrimination, microaggression, and different groups um, experiencing um, the effects of COVID differently. You know, as you've alluded, I think, you know, we need, we need better data. And Maggie mentioned this, I think, you know, um, states are, are moving um, not on, only as a result of researchers requests, but also journalists, everyone asking um, how they need to even um, take into account, they have to um, report a uh, race of individuals. As I mentioned earlier, one third of cases in Massachusetts, we don't know their race. And I think I find that, you know, quite disturbing, you know, like for, other things we tend to do a good job of identifying race, but for an important outcome such as this, we don't, uh, we tend not to do that, um, which is, is an important, um, you know, uh, work that needs to be done. Maybe um, just I'll get back to what uh, Maggie, you've been saying. I think we know about the pre-existing social inequalities, including, you know, 
less, less reliable access to healthcare and higher rates of chronic diseases. Um, what are some of the practical things communities and institutions can do to address this? You've mentioned some things, including job security, um, providing of resources and access to, um, to food and other resources. And I wonder if there are some practical things communities and institutions can do to address this. And I'll, I'll pose the same question to you, Cindy. Are there things that communities could do to address effects of discrimination and, and stigma associated with um, would affect mental health outcomes in racial ethnic minorities? So I think there are several things communities can do. One of the things is uh, communities should uh, advocate to their uh, local authorities about having very good interinstitutional coordination. I think one of the issues that we've seen in this epidemic is the lack of coordination uh, across silos from the healthcare system to the social system to the criminal justice system. I mean, the epidemic should have shown light in the importance of having in interinstitutional coordination across services in localities. I think a second thing that communities should advocate for is the importance of the expansion of the ACA, the Accountable Care Organization. We've seen quite a bit of scientific data showing that this is one of the interventions, uh, policy interventions that can reduce disparities in terms of access to healthcare. And this should be salient for our populations to get access not only for health, but for mental health too. And I think the one of the things that the other thing that I think we should be more uh, as, as communities more pushing for is getting uh, information in different languages early, timely, and also being able to have messengers that we trust. I think we we don't necessarily people do you know some general information, but some people I mean and. I don't blame them. My feel that they don't trust the people that are presenting this information in forums. They need to have uh, people that they trust in their community that are doing outreach and taking the message out so that people can really relate to this and act uh, in a timely fashion. Indeed. You know, I mentioned the word narratives earlier, and I, I feel very strongly that when we think about communication, sort of the first piece of communication comes out as that first narrative. And so um, at this point, there's all sorts of stories about and explanations for what is happening at the moment. And again, what you know, Dr. Alegria had mentioned is that um, it's not cohesive. And because of that, people, you know, can run away with different um, explanations for what is happening. And by doing so, giving, um, giving that first narrative sort of um, a break and allowing that to happen. I think that's what's happening with, for instance, the racial incidences against Asians. Um, but also when we think about, um, you know, um, African-American communities being disproportionately represented in the, um, as patients, um, that once that comes out, again, there's explanations for what that is. But um, we have to be careful about how that's actually stated, because sometimes that can be reinforcing of existing um, attitudes. You know, the mm -hmm. fact that um, people have started to call this disease a, a Chinese disease or a, you know, in some um, um, things that I've read, a, a Black person's disease, it, it really harkens back to um, history, the, the, the fact that these attitudes have been there for so long, for centuries. And um, it's completely entrenched. And so when we think about disparities now, it's not a surprise to many of us. It's completely rooted in history and in these structures. And so when we think about change, it's not an easy change. And I think people need to begin to recognize that what they believe isn't just sort of what they came up with. It's rooted in something more. Um, and to be able to challenge that is hard, but I think really takes sort of everybody to do that. Well said, um, uh, Cindy and, and, and Maggie. Um, 
I think, you know, I, I agree. Um, narratives are important. I think oftentimes um, in, in our um, reporting of facts and figures, you know, um, there's, there's so much that is lost in that. And, and I think, um, you know, we need more efforts um, that are rooted in communities trying to, to highlight um, issues. So just related to that, we tend to have in the bio um, medical and academic institutions a top down approach you know how can we um, what are some of the lessons that we are learning that are bottom up that are rooted in communities trying to um, maybe help us get to some sustainable long term solutions? Are there things that we are learning lessons in the immediate aftermath that uh, we could draw up on that would allow us to sustain those? And, and have um, solutions that are more long-term. Yeah, I, I definitely think that one of the lessons we've learned is the importance of trust in community leaders. I think that that has come out very um, high. I think the other one is the importance of community outreach. I think we are not doing sufficiently in community outreach to um, basically get uh, people in terms of prevention and mitigation of the pandemic uh, early enough. And I think another very important aspect that we have learned from this epidemic, and I hope we don't forget quickly, is how by gutting the public health uh, authorities, we are really paying a huge, huge price. We've been eight years gutting public health and we need to reconstruct public health authorities in localities, in our localities, give them the resources to do that in their uh, institutional coordination, keep monitoring what's happening in the localities, not only with respect to uh, you know, health, but the social determinants, also the importance of how people are feeling connected to the public health in terms of getting uh, a reciprocal relation. And bringing in, I think, the uh, academic, uh, academic community partnerships are the other learning lesson for me, that we should uh, be on the ground. Our studies, for example, with academic community partnerships with community-based organizations, have been tremendously important in this time because they're the people that are, are trusted in the community and we can then relay, they're the experts in what's happening in the community and what are the needs. And we can also bring them any evidence-based information that might help mitigate what's happening. What I wanted to point out is that um, for, for every group, there's also a lot of variation in attitudes and approaches. And I think a challenge that we're facing is that not everyone is on the same page. You know? So we may be trying to, um, to promote a community and advocate for a community. There may be members within that community who don't think that's necessarily the right approach. Um, and so that, that's, that, when, I, when I see that, I think of um, the fact that um, there are, recognizing there are informal leaders in communities that we don't necessarily recognize. Um, we as academics, providers, people in policy don't recognize who those informal leaders are. Um, and so what that means is getting to know the community um, and creating uh, liaisons with the community to just simply know um, what, what's transpiring in there and how can we um, work together with them to, to um, understand what their needs are. You know, if there's different variations in, in what people are wanting, um, you know, is, is there a place where we can kind of all, all come and, and um, recognize and try to promote everyone? Um, sometimes it's just, it's just seen as just different or people can't get along. But I, I think we need to start to look a bit more carefully um, to, to understand what's happening there. Um, and I mentioned that simply because, you know, um, as, as this pandemic has um, taken place over the past several weeks, things have changed. People are quickly changing their minds about what is the right approach, whether we should use masks or not masks. You know, um, you know who should wear a mask? Um, when and who, who can actually feel safe wearing a mask? And so um, because things are changing by the moment, um, it's, it's all the more critical to really solidify communities. 
Um, so, so yeah, I would say just to, you know, to be mindful of these differences. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, you know, context matters, um, but also recognizing, um, you know, this, those informal leaders is going to be critical. Um, I guess, I think, you know, one of the other solutions that's often discussed in the area of mental health is the use of telemedicine, mm -hmm. how this is um, going to be important. And I wonder if we could, both of you could um, share your thoughts into, you know, it's an excellent option, but also what are some of the additional issues and considerations that one needs to take into account in proposing a solution such as a telehealth to address mental health effects? So we, we're doing actually a, a project uh, that's mostly using uh, telephones to actually connect with people. Uh, we're finding that people not necessarily have uh, state-of-the-art telephones. So sometimes, you know, uh, sending information ahead of time so that they have something visual in addition to the telehealth component has been very critical. So we, so for example, we offer you a workbook and then you have the information that you discuss by the phone. But the other thing we're finding is people uh, have limited minutes on their phones. So one of the things we're trying to do uh, is get people either more minutes or sending them a phone that they can use to talk in this telehealth of mental health so that they have enough minutes to feel comfortable. I think a third issue that we're finding with telehealth is the importance of uh, having a quiet time because many of the families live in very crowded, uh, highly dense households. So sometimes we have to change the telehealth to either very late at night or very early in the morning where family members are not gonna be included. I think the other part about telehealth is that it really, you have to be able to also synchronize into what's the attention span people have. And sometimes I think we, some of these uh, interventions are long. And so we've been able to um, maneuver in having them 30 minutes for people that have difficulty, you know, keeping pace with only the phone. But I think it's fantastic. I, I honestly really like the telephone idea. I think one of the issues that I think will be needed is to have the possibility that we can do like the Veterans Administration where people can uh, be uh, out of state. So for example, right now in, in one of our projects, we have a Cantonese speaking person that needed to have a Cantonese speaking uh, community health worker do the program with them. But in, in North Carolina, they didn't have anyone like that. So we could do this because it's a psychosocial program, we could do it by phone because we do have Cantonese speaking uh, community health workers. So having this ability to move the resources to give the psychosocial treatment across states will be quite important. So we have enough uh, capacity, linguistic capacity, as well as cultural capacity to address what people need. I think it's also something um, that, that you'd mentioned where we need to expand um, coordination across places. So um, would this be a case where expanding uh, coordination uh, would allow for, for having more access to uh, different um, groups? Yeah, I absolutely think that we could do more that is uh, either at a national level or where we could actually move resources where they're needed at different times. Because, I mean, uh, I agree totally with Dr. Lu that, that, you know, not everyone wants things the same way, but we could actually uh, have enough capacity in training and then have resources, linguistic resources, you know, in different languages. So if someone needs, you know, uh, Portuguese, we have the capacity to do it by telehealth. But some of the legislation of what you can do and who can get paid for it is another big one. Uh, we, for example, we have been working for the five, uh, last five years with community-based organizations. 
and are trying to get uh, funding for community health workers that can be trained in like the first line so that they can serve as first line supervised by licensed clinicians weekly, but that they can provide some, at least expand the capacity for many of our diverse populations where we don't have people on the ground to provide this help. Right, Cindy. I'm just gonna speak to the individual and provider experience of telehealth. I mean, First of all, I think there's so many positives to telehealth. It used to be that transportation cost and time, and then for many, they have to get childcare so that they can go see their doctor. Um, that, that, you know, that's not so much of an issue um, when you do have telehealth. And so that was one of the bigger barriers to access. Um, I also think that another um, positive aspect to telehealth is the fact that for providers, they can actually see individuals in their natural setting somewhat, you know, um, to be able to get a sense of their experience at home, which you don't necessarily get in a clinician's office. Um, and this is particularly important, I would say, for, um, for pediatricians um, and for, um, you know, those uh, mental health clinicians to be able to see how people experience life at home. Um, that being said, the challenge with telehealth, I would say, is the, one of the major ones is privacy. So if you are a therapist, to be able to talk with somebody about um, vulnerable and sensitive issues, um, that may be very, very challenging to do at home. And so a um, question is, how can we create, um, uh, you know, how, how can we create a space for individuals to do that? Is that even possible to do? Um, people who have a lot of uh, family members or who have roommates and so forth, um, that there may be limitations to what they share. Um, um, at home. And so, um, but I, I think that, you know, there are some things that, you know, we can overcome. First of all, not everybody has a, a, a laptop, iPad. Those are expensive items. Um, people don't have it for all members of the family. So we see that in um, the remote, remote learning people who have more than a few kids, you know, they don't have enough devices for their chil children to be able to, to do school right now. And so um, those same challenges, I think, would also take place um, when we think about telehealth. So um, I think investments within the family, um, I mean, if this is going to be our future going forward, then everybody needs to have um, a laptop, right? If we, we want everyone to have access to healthcare, that is the access, is a device. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, this this issue of digital divide is, is a real one. And I think, you know, um, knowing the 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 benefits and the utilities of using telehealth, expanding that access. And, you know, as Maggie mentioned, many of the people, they may just have flip phones and they may not necessarily have access to um, high speed internet and be able to mm -hmm. see providers. So uh, with that comes like, the, the need for expanding the, the, um, the access issues. Um, I would love to continue the conversation, but I know that people are asking questions. We have over 240 uh, participants asking different questions. But before I do that, um, I know my colleagues, Kirsten Conan and Arshina Basu are on the panel. Let me just give them um, the opportunity if they have questions or, or thoughts to, to chime in. Uh, can I start with you, Kirsten? Sure. Thank you so much. I'm actually learning a lot um, from listening to both um, Dr. Liu and Dr. Alegria. One of the things, um, this comes off something Dr. Alegria said, it's something that I've been thinking about, and this is a little bit, um, uh, you've talked about um, the community health workers and having people um, connected that aren't necessarily in the same place, if they, if, for example, with the Cantonese speaking. And I've been wondering is if we can learn anything from how um, people have addressed mental health in low and middle income settings that we can bring to our experience here. So I'm more familiar. You guys have much more expertise here. My work is more in, in, in Africa doing um, work on capacity building and things. And there's always been, whenever I've tried to, like say in a grant award, try to pitch the idea of like going from global to local, it's been, usually not well received, but I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to use some of the ideas that maybe have worked elsewhere, along the lines that of community health workers or people outside the traditional system, so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
we have we are trying it and and it's working i would say relatively well to use community health workers we've actually um just publish a, a we publish a paper showing that uh we could get people better uh in terms of mental health and functioning and this was elder people uh and we did the intervention and the program in four languages this is a oh paper God. we published in um, american journal of Ger geriatric psychiatry okay. and we showed we could do it you know and do it um fairly well with community health workers that are supervised by licensed clinicians and where we actually put a lot of controls for making sure that people are safe that if their symptomatology starts getting higher that we can flag it and then immediately send the case to services so mm -hmm. i think it's that we have learned a lot from low-income countries low and middle income countries i completely agree with you Karisman that this could be done uh, and, and um, I think we need to pay for it. I think that that's the issue, paying that's for yeah. community-based yeah. organizations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think, you know, just if I may add, Karsten, um, I, I, I have a, a work in uh, the Mississippi uh, Delta, and one of the things that we're trying to do is lessons that we've learned from our work in Peru could be directly applicable in Mississippi where the median household income is about 29,000. So in many ways, I think there are lessons that we learn in other parts of the world could be highly applicable in many places in the US where, um, you know, when we think of mental health, um, every country is, is a developing country and there are lessons that we could um, apply definitely from, from our work elsewhere to the US. Archana? I think you're muted. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes. It's been such a wonderful panel um, and really great to hear the comments from Maggie and Cindy. Um, I guess I'll just add, um, while there are many points to pick up on, that I think increasing overall access um, to health and mental health, as Maggie mentioned, of course, remains the most, I think, critical rate limiting factor. Um, I think even within the existing system, um, there are several places that we can begin. Uh, the mental health parity um, you know, advocacy efforts have been in place for many years, but we know that at an implementation level, um, parity for mental health in terms of uh, reimbursement remains a significant issue. Um, there are also health and behavior codes offered by a lot of insurance companies, which essentially state that mental health consequences as a result of a physical health diagnosis um, should be considered as a physical health benefit, and that remains a very gray area as well. Um, and I think fundamentally we remain a very tertiary care and sick care system rather than building on public health and preventive efforts, um, which would include um, building the types of community-based collaborations that both our speakers talked about. And as a child psychologist, I would add, that would also include really thinking about our school communities in addition to you know, many of the other faith-based and other informal um, you know, key stakeholders. In the United States, um, there's been recent data at a population level to show that um, for, I believe this is from 2012 to 2015, among children receiving mental health care treatment, uh, about 35% of them, their only access to mental health care is through the school-based systems. And that is often disproportionately in under-resourced and um, minority communities. So I think there's sort of larger scale and long-term changes that need to, be ha to happen that our speakers have highlighted and also existing places within our current system where we could kind of begin to look for more advocacy and change. Thanks. Um, thank you, Kersen and Arshana. Um, we have quite a number of questions. Um, apologies in advance that I'm not going to get to all questions, but I'll uh, peek and um, read some of the questions. This first question is, how are some of the effects of COVID-19 on mental health disparities within the workplace? Have, is, there, is there any data, anything that you could um, say, Maggie or Cindy? 
Uh, I haven't seen too much data uh, related to differences in the um, in the workplace, except uh, I've been looking at data on whether people, you know, the issues about uh, insurance coverage and seeing that insurance coverage, especially for blacks, there's a lot of underinsurance of black people, there's a lot of underinsurance and obviously Latinos and Asian American uh, Indians, and, and they have jobs that don't provide employer healthcare. Uh, so that's one issue that has uh, come to light. The other one is this issue about telehealth, how low uh, ethnic racial minorities have access to telehealth um, and how that impedes for them to be like uh, Cindy or myself, to be on the phone and or in Zoom and be able to work at a distance. So I think that those are the ones that I've seen more. I don't know, Cindy, if you know more. I don't. I mean, um, certainly there are discrimination. Um, uh, experiences that are occurring in the workplace. So I have seen that in our data, whether it uh, impacts mental health. I mean, I'm assuming it does, right? I don't have data, um, in the, you know, linking the two, but what we are saying is that that discrimination is taking place in the workplace. We had one respondent who said in an open field question that their boss was just, you know, talking about um, where the transmission was coming from and making jokes about it. And this person was the only Asian person in the workplace. And so, you know, these conversations and, and, and microaggressions are taking place in different settings, including the workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Bulls. Um, this question is for you, Cindy. Um, do you have any sense why the rates of anxiety and depression is so low among Black and Asian population based on the CARE 2020 data? Yeah, so our data is pretty preliminary at this point, but that difference is pretty striking. Um, so uh, the thing is, this is not inconsistent with a lot of other data showing um, lower rates of mental health um, symptoms among um, my minority populations. Um, there's, it depends on the study, but there's a good number of studies that have found this to be the case, including some data sets that I've looked at before. Um, when I look a bit closer at the data and I look at other types of, um, of outcomes or you, you could call a protect, protective factors, we're also seeing that minorities tend to report having more social support. And so um, it could be a function of this data set in that many of the individuals um, feel connected with their communities and that may be a reason for why they're not necessarily reporting um, poor social support or poor mental health. And it all could also be the case that what they're experiencing now is not necessarily impacting um, their mental health at the moment. Again, it goes back to very early on in, our, um, in this hour where we talked about that it's the consequences of experiences that are gonna affect um, um, the mental health of um, individuals. So um, I, I don't have an answer for that at this point, but um, it's not inconsistent with other uh, findings that um, in other data sets. Thanks, thanks, Sidney. Um, the next question is, how can we best support patients who are afraid of identifying their race and ethnic background, given their current um, immigration status in the COVID-19 era? Is there, is there anything being done at MGH, uh, Maggie? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that people are doing is uh, trying to ensure as, more, as much confidentiality in the data. You know, there are very strict rules uh, and uh, HIPAA information, you know, if you think about it, you can get, um, you know, a ticket or you can get uh, actually an, an impact for revealing information like that. I think the one thing I would say is for people to be, you know, one of the things that I have told people that have asked is really be uh, very clear that you don't want this information to be revealed, that you really will not be willing to reveal this information and share it with anyone. So for example, one of the things we do in our projects is we ask people, do you want to uh, say about this information about mental health or substance abuse to your primary care provider? And we find out, you know, no, there's quite a bit of people that say they don't. Uh, or do you want this information to be shared with ex, you know, family members? Or So we actually make, I think the, the policies should be that 
you only reveal information that people are willing and sign consent for revealing. So to me, that's, I think MGH is trying very uh, carefully to make sure that no information gets revealed to anyone. And that should be the case in most hospitals. Most hospitals, I think, are trying to be very careful about people releasing race or ethnicity information because of uh, the problems with ICE and problems with, you know, uh, public charge. Cindy, do you have anything more? Not really. I mean, I think that of the providers that I've uh, spoke with about this, they're very, very careful about under the circumstances for which they ask these questions. And um, it goes back to trust too. Do you trust your provider about what this information will be used for and so forth? So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, another question is, do we know anything about the mental health experience of Native Americans in this pandemic? Um, is there any data that is coming out that gives us um, um, a clue? Well, I mean, I was in a panel uh, with, uh, I think, the congresswoman from, um, I think it was Albuquerque, and she was saying, would, you know, they're having very, very high rates of COVID in the Native American population. Uh, and obviously, I mean, we know from COVID that this, if you have the virus, that the implications and the anxiety linked to having the virus and the consequences of the virus in being able to work, being able to, they don't have data as of such, and we have very limited data of Native American populations. It's terrible. I mean, there are some people that have uh, done great job like Spiro Manson or Douglas Nobins, and uh, there's quite a bit of people that are trying to collect that data, but we're very limited in the data that we have because the numbers are so small that we don't like to present the data um, without enough sample size, like uh, Cindy was saying. Yeah, I can say that at least in our data set, we have a very, very small number, so much that I am uncomfortable to report um, on, on that data. So the, the data is so limited, and I think you know, I, I've, need, I've been needing to think more carefully about how to, how to um, do outreach with these communities in order to obtain sufficient data for us to report. Thank you. Thank you, Boz. Um, there's this question, which I'm also curious about. Um, Maggie, you mentioned about um, the increased rates of IPV or domestic violence. Um, how do you handle issues of domestic violence or IPV uh, using telehealth, um, is there any work that is being done, something that, that you could share? Well, I have to say we are confronting some of that actually in one, in one of our trials where, you know, one of the partners doesn't want their uh, other partner to be part of uh, having uh, this program. And so what we're trying to do is actually talk to the person, to the partner that is resisting it, to give the, uh, give the person the importance of helping someone that you love uh, and how this really has impacts for everyone in the family, not only for that person, but for the children and for maintaining stability in their relationship. So we, I think that this is, but I think many people are, you know, having such difficulties and many of the shelters for uh, abuse have been closed. So it's making it very difficult for people to find alternatives. So I think hotlines uh, and, and being able to have, in this case, you know, the person reach out to us and we're trying to then um, explain to the partner that this is really critical uh, for the well-being of that person and hopefully we'll see if they agree. Well, um, I think, you know, I could spend another hour or two with both of you discussing okay. this. I don't think we need a pandemic to um, know that we have, um, you know, a big work addressing existing disparities in mental health, but I really appreciate the time that you've taken to answer those questions. Um, I'll turn it over to Karsten. I'm mindful of the time. We only have two minutes, but um, 
maybe some final words and announcements? <laughs> well, I just wanted to thank our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Liu and Dr. Alegria for joining us and for to be Zoo for always doing a really great job moderating. Um, our next panel next week at the same time, 11 a.m., is Dr. Archana Basu and Dr. Chris Germer on self-compassion in the time of COVID-19. I know that some, um, uh, Sh Shaylee had posted in the chat, people can look at the website. This will be, this recording will be posted on the website as are all previous recordings. And some of the questions had asked for some specific strategies about different things. Some of those are covered in um, other forum. And also posted will be, um, we pulled together a ways of, that people can help or be active in their communities or help communities that are disproportionately affected by COVID um, in the US, but also especially in the Boston area. So we will post those and we will distribute them. Um, so Shaylee, I saw just put them up, up, just put the link up. And so there, there will be a link to that. It's in the chat right now. We'll also be sending it out. Um, and if you want to, you can um, let us know. You can join our email list or follow. I mean, Dr. Lou, Dr. Galaya and I are on Twitter. You can follow us there where we, where we also post this information. So thank you. Thank you so much and stay safe and well, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.